What's up, peers? And I welcome you to join the Wasabi Cast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Today, I sit down with the one and only Shane Radcliffe from Liberty Under Attack Publications and the Vanu Podcast. Vanu stands for Voluntary, Not Vulnerable. It is a liberation strategy for sovereign individuals to increase their freedom today in the here and now and to increase their mean time to harassment, which is uh, the, the great metric of how free you actually are, like how long since last someone stole from you, uh, either, of course, a private individual or the biggest attacker, the state. Uh, and this lifestyle is very compelling with a very wide-ranging uh, bouquet of nuanced strategies uh, from as extreme as wilderness vanu and camping outside in the woods, far away from any potential attacker, uh, to things like van and nomadism or digital nomadism in general, uh, and all the way down to having a homestead, a citadel, uh, to grow your own beef uh, and uh, to raise your cattle uh, and, well, to live a free life. Uh, also, part of Vanu is privacy itself, right? To selectively reveal yourself to the world. Because, well, if the attacker does not know who you are and what you do and how you communicate, well, he will not attack you. Uh, and this is a rather efficient way uh, to increase your mean time to harassment by being more selective with how you reveal yourself to the world. Pierce, this really was a fantastic conversation that I enjoy quite a lot because, well, I've learned quite a bit from Shane over the last couple of years, uh, specifically in the Vanu podcast. So we very much encourage you uh, to check this one out. And on somewhat of a technical note here up front before we actually get into the show, uh, is that we have upgraded. Uh, Join the Wasabi cast is now a, uh, on the podcasting 2.0 ecosystem, meaning specifically uh, that we are experimenting with some cutting edge Bitcoin and podcasting technology. Uh, and that is especially a, uh, that we have hooked up our RSS feed uh, to a Bitcoin Lightning Network node, uh, meaning that if you are actually in favor uh, and if you receive some value out of all these countless conversations that we're having here, uh, you can toss us some sets uh, automatically in a podcasting 2.0 enabled podcatcher uh, per minute uh, or even boosting some content that you like. Um, I would very much encourage you to check it out just well for the fun of it uh, because it's really cool technology. So get a capable podcatcher like the Breeze Lightning Network Wallet or the Sphinx chat application. Where, by the way, we also have a join the Wasabi Cast tribe for some chatter amongst the peers listening. Uh, this is a grand experiment and only the beginning of it. Uh, we will do some more interesting, uh, more interactive formats uh, for this podcast in the near future or after some back end magic has been set up. Uh, but, Pierce, without any further ado, let's get actually into this conversation about all things Vanu on how to live voluntary, not vulnerable, and how to increase our mean time to harassment. Thank you very much for listening. So, Shane, happy, very happy to have you here today for this conversation. Uh, how's it going? How is it at Pasnia? Hey, uh, yeah, things are good. Uh, things are good. Um, as uh, um, for folks who listen to who listen to the Vani podcast and caught our last conversation, I'm working uh, working on uh, food self sufficiency here at uh, the Free Republic of Pasnia, as I'm calling it. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's going well. Uh, I guess since the last month month or so, we've we've talked. The ducks are about twice as big, if not more. And, uh, yeah, I just, uh, just got another five lambs, uh, this past weekend and, uh, we'll be getting uh, a few new goats uh, as well over the next week or two. So, um, yeah, the, the objective is to, uh, is to double, double the crew each year of, uh, of lambs. And, uh, do we, uh, d- achieve that, uh, this past weekend? Th- does yep. that scale? Yep. Exactly. No, it, well, no, it only scales to a certain point. When you, when you have 22 acres, there's only so many, so much doubling. Um, but, but yeah, we just, uh, just recently in the past couple of months, we ran, uh, I've got, there's basically two, two fields, two, um, on either side of the driveway and you've got electric fences running down the, the whole side of the, uh, I guess the west side of the driveway and then on the east side of the driveway. Um, yeah, that one's not, uh, that one's not uh, fenced off yet, but, uh, yeah, next year or two, we'll, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing, uh, a field full of lambs. So, um, that's, that's what we're working on over here, uh, as well as uh, obviously more of the uh, the second realm sort of uh, intentional community uh, foundational stuff. So, um, yeah, things are good. Uh, it's progressing. Just uh, taking our time and en- enjoying it. And, uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, pretty much it right now. Oh, fantastic. 
I mean, it, it seems like you're you're pretty far down the Bitcoin or freedom and self liberation rabbit hole. But l- let's go back a couple of years. Like, w- what do you think kind of kickstarted your your roll uh, down this journey, and what motivates you? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I I actually started uh, Libertarian Attack Radio, which is, is now defunct. It's uh, Liber- Libertarian Attack Publications. Uh, where we publish uh, actually a second round book on strategy and some some other uh, some other agorists and and crypto anarchy sort of uh, sort of books. But uh, yeah, I started LUA Radio back in February of 2015, and uh, you know, it was very much at that time um, was not uh, into the self liberation stuff. wasn't uh, what I would call an anarchist. had never even heard of the term Vanuan. Uh, had, obviously, hadn't come across Second Realm stuff yet. Um, I was, uh, I guess, you could say, more of a minarchist constitutionalist here, um, you know, um, in, the, in the states, and um, I guess more in kind of the conspiratorial conspiratorial realm. Uh, dug through a lot of uh, Bill Cooper, uh, the now now late Bill Cooper's uh, material for anyone who might be familiar with that. So that's actually where I started. It was way back, way back there, back in 2014, 2015. And uh, yeah, very soon after I started LA Radio, um, I came across some some anarchists, and I guess uh, anarchy wasn't what I'd been told it was, uh, as is uh, as is the case for most everything. And uh, I uh, it went down uh, the deep dive of Austrian economics. You know, read the the Rothbard, the Mises, got through Human Action, which I'm still pretty proud of. Um, and, uh, got through kind of the economic stuff, went through some of the philosophy and I got to a point, uh, you know, being in alternative media, you know, there were a lot of podcasts, a lot of, you know, libertarian podcasts and radio shows and, and, uh, all that, but there really was a, a major lacking of, uh, of solutions. Like, okay, um, obviously free markets are good. Like that's, that's the preferable, th- preferable way, right? Like no, no coercion. Um, and yeah, obviously the state is the biggest inflictor of that coercion. So why don't we just kind of, you know, let's, let's, let's be free now. Like, what, what are we going to do about it? And, it wasn't really a whole lot to talk about it beyond agorism. Um, obviously, Bitcoin was was around at that time, but it still wasn't as big as it was. It obviously, wasn't a, you know as um, where where uh, where it is today. So yeah, I uh, I I got uh, I I saw an opening and uh, really just took it. And uh, we did uh, what I call the direct action series. We did that over on Elio Radio back in uh, 2016. And uh, yeah, from then I uh, came across Vanu, um, which uh, is we can we can definitely get into get into more, but. Um, I came across Vanu and uh, Rayo and this, uh, I guess, this really hidden portion of libertarian history, and uh, you know, a very, very um, practical and um, very uh, forward-looking. Um, you know, very, very Rayo, the uh, the main, the uh, the founder of Vanu, actually, now no, we know that for sure. Um, he was a very forward-thinking individual, and back in the 1960s, he was writing about, uh, um, as we've talked about in conversations over at the Vanu podcast, Max. Uh, uh, he was very much a cypherpunk. He, uh, you know, obviously utilized a pseudonym talking about uh you know encrypted i guess uh ham radio encrypted ham radio networks um that would serve as you know commerce back in the day so like he was a very forward-looking individual and um that kind of opened my eyes to to a lot of things uh these radical lifestyle changes um that uh that that bonnie kind of relies upon and uh, came across second realm um at some point and uh <laughs> i i love that um i love that because uh there's there's a lot of uh, organizing the digital realm you know like with bitcoin for example and that's fantastic but um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, especially after last year, um, when uh, a lot of things started breaking down in the physical world, and um, you know, um, access to food and you know other survi- other things necessary for survival became difficult. So, um, you know, the, the most important thing now, at least in, in, at least what I'm focusing on, is is actual actually organizing in physical space and time, and that's what where I saw so much value in, in, in the second round book on strategy is. Um, well, you, obviously, there are digital pockets of freedom um, that provide that provide freedom. But, um, you know, the physical space and time is important too. So, um, that's, uh, I've been, I guess that's, that's kind of the, the, the long and long and short of it is I, I, I randomly, I just stumbled across things in my, in my path and, um, some of them seem to, to, to make a lot of sense and seem practical. And, um, you know, here I am, uh, the Free Republic of Pasnia and, uh, I guess, uh, I guess just kind of make, making a go at, uh, putting together the Second Realm Network here in the, and, and, uh, you know, what's, uh, here, uh, you know, in, the, in so-called the USSA. So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Pretty much it. Nice, nice. Uh, very nice layout of, of all this conversation that we can have now. Many rabbit holes to go down to. Uh, first string that I would like to pull uh, is actually mm-hmm. Liber- or Liberty Under Attack uh, Radio. Like th- this kind of seemed to be like your your forte, your first step into this entire ecosystem. Uh, but I mean, why? Like, why did you decide to kind of speak up and and to share this mm-hmm. knowledge that you were gathering? Yeah, yeah. I guess. Um... Really, it's, it, uh, it, and, and I, I guess I kind of went over it very quickly, but Bill Cooper was a major, major, um, foundational part, um, of, 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 you know, where I, uh, you know, where, where I am today. Essentially, like I said, I went through a lot of his material. I went through all 2000 plus hours 
uh, on his on that are uh, archived. I think they're still archived on on his website, hourofthetime.com. Um, but so I went through all those archives. I've listened to his you know nine hour pre- his, all his presentations that are on fascist tube. Um, you know, I dug through all that material, and uh, you know, it, it all really resonated with me at the time. And uh, you know, I saw it you know really valuable. His focus on the Constitution. He was, um, you know, he was actually doing things. You know, organizing militias there in Arizona, and that was really important to me at the time. And um, I guess uh, there was uh, one one part of uh, in one of his presentations. I think he was saying uh, um, he doesn't. He obviously he didn't care if people disagreed with him, and he he obviously is for you know freedom of speech. And you see, one one thing he said was you know if you if you, you know, um, um, if you have something to say, start a radio show. And that was like very, very impactful to me at the time. And I uh, just kind of uh, decided, uh, you know, Bill, Bill uh, you know, died in 2001. And at that time, I, I didn't see a replacement. Like I didn't, I wasn't familiar with, I guess, the so-called replacement for Bill on the radio. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, but that very, very quickly changed. So that was my original motivation was um, my the original path was just that, uh, you know, I didn't see anyone that was, you know, filling the, the gap of truth that he was. And I thought I was going to be that person and everything worked out very very differently um, i guess not not necessarily differently but um that it, it's uh it didn't end up uh where i thought it would for sure um but yeah that, that was pretty much it and obviously there was a, a passion for freedom um for what I, I guess what i thought freedom was at the time um which certainly that's evolved what, what was your, but, your freedom um, at that time yeah yeah i mean like i said i was a anarchist constitutionalist so my, my view on freedom was was basically um i guess uh, the very confused view of freedom um, I think at that time I was even pro police, which is strange, um, thinking about, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was really just kind of the, um, the, the minarchist, uh, you know, limited government constitutional position. Like that was, it was just that generic kind of starting point where a lot of people get stuck at. Um, but yeah, I, w- I wasn't there for very long, but it was, um, and then it, it evolved with, with, with Bill and it got back to kind of, um, more of the, you know, the, I guess the, the actual, I guess, so-called original interpretation of the constitution and, and militias and, um, and, and those sorts of things, uh, kind of the, the, I guess the, a lot of the constitutional militia type stuff. That was, that was where I was at that time. Um, that, that was, that was where it was. Uh huh. Interesting. And, w- and what type of format was that radio actually? Was it just you blabbering and doing presentations as, as Bill often did? Or was it more a guest type of interview? Um, so the first few months, I guess it was more so, um, we had a couple of guests, but it was a two hour live radio show. Um, sometimes I had guests, sometimes it was me and, uh, me and a, a co-host, I had many, many co-hosts over the, f- over the few years on, on LUA. But, um, yeah, a lot of time, uh, initially it was more so just me and, me and co-hosts. And then be after that, um, especially like the direct action series, it was always interviews. So, um, pretty much it evolved into, an, into an interview only format, um, pretty quickly, I would say. Mm-hmm. And, and why interviews? Why do you think that that's a, a meaningful type of conversation to share? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, especially for the direct action series, um, you know, these were especially back in 2016. Still now, there's a lot of a lot of these strategies and um, you know lifestyle changes that I haven't tried out myself. So the the value of having a guest is that these people were all had all been doing these things for you know few years or five years or 15 years or 20 years. They had a lot of experience. They had a lot of resources, a lot of knowledge. Um, so that was it. It, it kind of naturally evolved into that because it would have been. Um, there's only so much that I was familiar with when I was, uh, when I started, I guess when we did the direct action series, I was like 22 or 23 at the time. I really didn't have a lot of life experience to, to draw upon there. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty much primarily the, the interviews where a lot of that, a lot of that value came from, um, really, really incredible guests, um, that, you know, we're doing a lot of incredible things back then and a lot of them still are. Um, so yeah, that'd be the, the major, the, the major benefit. I mean, that's, that's where I, I, I got a lot of knowledge out of it, got a lot of, uh, um, I mean, it expanded my worldview a lot. Um, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these things, a lot, of, they don't talk about these strategies, um, you know, in your, um, in your thousands of hours of, you know, indoctrination in government, you know, government schools. They don't talk about these things. So, um, I, and that's kind of been, um, something I've, I've really honed in on in the past, in the past year or so is, um, you know, gotta, gotta expand that, uh, that view. You gotta keep, it's, it's hard to find where, I guess, where the, um, it's hard to figure out where the, pro, where the, I guess, where the propaganda and brainwashing ended. So, um, anyway, anyway, um, that's, that's, that's base that's, that's basically it. Um, yeah, base yeah, just a lot, a lot of value from guests, a lot of value from guests for sure. So, and, and yeah, for, for sure. Like, I, th- I think it's also a great excuse of, of being a podcaster or radio show host uh, to kind of get interesting people to talk to <laughs> because yes, kind of everyone yeah. <laughs> likes to, to be publicized and to be uh, well talked about. Uh, and for you as the host, it's a great, way to actually talk to people and to ask questions without 
kind of having this weird feeling of uh, interrogating someone <laughs> because it's publicly announced. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And, and, and beyond that, too, I mean, you, you, uh, that, that's a, an important thing, too, the networking. Um, you know, just have, being able to have these conversations, you know, reaching out to, um, you know, pretty, pretty large people, I guess, pretty popular people. I wouldn't be, there'd be, there'd be no reason for us to have a conversation before, right? Um, so yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Um, it, it, it definitely provides a, a very good excuse, um, for, you know, starting conversations with people. And it's a, it's, an, it's a good opportunity. It's open up the conversation for, for, you know, for, for the, for the public. So, um, that, that's another thing. But, but, you know, talk, uh, going back to the Free Republic of Pasnia too. Um, I mean, the, the radio show is what well, it was the foundation for everything I'm doing now, too. Um, so I, I found out about through LEA Radio, um, something called the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest in Michigan, um, in 2015 through a colleague and calling I met a colleague I met on, on the internet who started a little, I guess, organization, Liberate RVA down in Richmond, Virginia, Cal Molina. He told me about this freedom festival that's, uh, you know, is taking place. And I, uh, you know, just ended up, ended up showing up there. And now, um, I've got, uh, um, obviously, you know, um, we, uh, here at the Pasnia, we incorporate, you know, private security culture principles. Um, only people who I know or who have been vetted can come out here. Um, well, my first layer of trust, essentially, the, the first people that came out here for Bonnie Fest one, um, were essentially like, you know, the 20 or 25 people I've been going to freedom festivals with. Um, especially then the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest for the past five years or so. So, um, as far as the, I guess that, that that's a pretty, pretty significant thing too, is yeah, the, the podcasting, um, not only did it just provide, you know, good, you know, online networking skills like, um, an editor for Agoras Nexus now. Um, so I, I, you know, get paid Bitcoin to, um, you know, edit articles over there. Um, so that's, that's pretty neat. That wouldn't have happened without the podcast and all that. So, I mean, yeah, um, obviously the online stuff is great, but it's manifesting into physical space and time. Like we're actually building something here. Um, we're, de- we're, we're building something here and it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. And it all started with, um, just from just, I guess, uh, very, very, you know, not lack of a plan, lack of a vision. I was just doing what I thought, uh, doing what I, what I was passionate about, freedom, and was just going to see where it led. And yeah, that's, that's here we are. Mm-hmm. And, and, and right, this, this freedom and this kind of spontaneity can be very, uh, well disruptive at points, right? And, and you can almost radically change your, your course of action. And, and you said that this happened to you, right? That you some, eventually moved on from this radio type. Kind of what led you to that change? Yeah, yeah. So I guess, um, really, um, I, I wrote my book. I guess I, was, I finished my book, um, well, I guess mid, mid 2018 or so, um, Bonu, the search, uh, Bonu, uh, strategy for self liberation. And, um, I suppose that, that was about the time I was wrapping up LUA radio. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd already been doing the Bonu podcast and most everything we talked about on LUA, um, could have been worked into Bonu. So I, did, I didn't see a point in continuing both of them and LUA publications kind of naturally, um, kind of, uh, naturally started out of that. And, um, I guess it was, it was right around that time. Like there was, it was just, I don't know, changes in the air or something. I, I just started a, a new job as a, an electrician apprenticeship or electrician apprentice. And I was, uh, you know, gonna do that. You know, it was good paying, best paying job I ever had was, was, you know, trade. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a bad job. I, I enjoyed it. You know, there's you know, lots of learning, lots of opportunity, but after about six months or so, like, I just stopped going in. Like I, I just, I, I wasn't feeling it anymore. I, 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 I guess I, I made a decision to move in, move to uh, Austin, Texas, uh, move in with my co-host of the Vonnie podcast at that time, Kyler Reardon. And, uh, just made us, made a quick random, I guess, move to Austin, Texas. Never been to Austin before. Just kind of randomly felt like I was called to do it. I guess that's, that's the best way that I could, that I can explain it, you know, looking back on it. Um, but I ended up in Austin, was there for, for a couple few months and, um, they, they were renting an apartment, um, and the lease was coming up, um, near the end, the lease was coming up and I had a pretty quick, I had another pretty quick change in living situation that I had to make. And it just so happened that, uh, my buddy Jason Henza was coming down, uh, from Chicago to, uh, um, on, you know, driving down to Acapulco, Mexico. And, uh, I, uh, he, you know, he said, you know, I can come, come right by there, pick you up. We'll go to Acapulco and, um, you can come stay out there as long as you want to with me. And I was like, uh, so I, 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 uh, you know, made another crazy move. Um, never been to Acapulco, um, before either. Obviously never driven through there. Been to Mexico a couple times, like tourist spots for, for, you know, vacations, but never, drew, never road trip through Mexico. So, um, yeah, I, uh, hopped in the car with him and we road tripped Acapulco. I stayed there from, um, uh, I guess November to December, um, 2018, was it? 2018. Yeah. It's years all run together now, really. But yeah, it was at end of 2018, stayed there, uh, until, uh, until Christmas and then came back to, I was going to come back for the holidays to see my family and, um, never, never got back to, to Mexico. But, um, yeah, I, I ended up, uh, ended up back, uh, coming back to, 
the homestead where I am now. Had no plans to to start what I I'm, I'm start start what I have going on here now. But um, it was just like with I guess within the span of maybe like six months. Um, it was uh, uh it was a pretty nomadic adventure. Um, a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of spontaneity. Um, no real plan or or, or vision. We're just kind of going like going with it, and seeing seeing where where things ended up. And um, like I said, I ended up back here at the homestead and um. Couple, by that time, a couple, uh, some, some some folks in my network had started this. Uh, I guess this uh, travel, um, you know, uh, this uh, travel job, and uh, you know, they they uh, they they stop by the property every once in a while, and it kind of naturally coalesced into um, a spot for some for some of my nomadic people to to stop by and camp and, and all that. And uh, yeah, last year, uh, that that's I guess the the, the the worldwide nonsense kicked off, and I don't know. I got a little panicked. I I, I eat only meat essentially. And um, when uh, there were fears of uh, meat running out at the grocery store, which I was dependent upon then, which is not a good thing, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing now. But um, <laughs> yeah, that that fear kind of hit me, and so I went and got some lambs and some goats, and uh, here we are today. So um, yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it certainly wasn't a smooth, um, a smooth, well planned, well executed, um, <laughs> you know, plan by by any means, but. Um, you know, I think this is kind of the way that it, that it, that it had to happen. Um, I mean, it's kind of well, it's the way that it did happen, but um, I don't know. Um, it wasn't wasn't easy, and uh, you know, still figuring things out. I, I've obviously like before, and I've in in this life, like I've I've never done anything with like farming or livestock or anything like that. So I've I'm just learning everything as I'm going, and uh, you know, it's hopefully it pans out. It's going well so far. So that's kind of what I'm what I'm banking on to continue. Yeah, it's it's quite incredible how adaptive humans can be, right? And and how we can fit even in, in stressful, ever changing situations, and somehow make the best of it, right? So, w what do you think were some of the upsides as well as the downsides of that kind of erratic, nomadic uh, lifestyle? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess um, the with, with at least with, the, with at least the what I did the the most I guess the the worst thing was that I was I was basically wholly dependent. Um, I mean, I, I could travel. Um, but I, I didn't have, uh, you know, a good network of like online jobs to keep me, to keep me afloat at that time. So like it was very, very, um, you know, very sketchy, get sketchy financially. Um, so that was, that was kind of, uh, I guess one, one kind of downside. Um, that kind of, uh, the, the unknown, which the unknown is also positive too, in my opinion. So it, it kind of goes either way. Um, but really the positive, and, and this was, um, I guess this was the part to my, my entire decompression process from the deep, the, from the Serval Society. Um, like really like a, like a, and, and I noticed this myself, but with people, when you're in a, you know, nine to five job, um, you know, 40 hours a week forever, um, and you're always within that survival society mindset, you know, go, 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 survive, survive, survive. Um, you know, like it's, it's very, like it, it's, uh, um, you don't really have a lot, to, a whole lot of time to think about anything else, right? So, um, that really, that was kind of the first opportunity I had. Um, cause when I was, I was either working and or going to higher level indoctrination college. Um, you know, before that, so there wasn't a whole lot of time to really think about anything to, to reflect on my life growing up and, and all of that. So, um, that was really the first time where I, I call what I, I call, and, and this is what Rayo called it too back in the 1960s, but, um, I live what I call now a liberated lifestyle where my time is my own. I, I decide my schedule. I decide what I do. Um, and that started, um, essentially like it, it really fully started, um, I would say last year, but that, that was kind of the first opportunity I had for, for a, a multiple month span. Um, to really start going through that. So, so yeah, that was a major upside, a major upside that even though, um, it was, uh, tumultuous, even though it was, um, you know, very dicey at times, um, like there was, my time was my own still. And, and there was a lot of value in that. There was a lot of, you know, even through kind of the chaos, there was that, um, kind of that, that kind of calm, you know, that, that, that the freedom was, I, I could kind of feel that, that little, I guess that, that hint of freedom. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, certainly the the catalyst for a lot of things to come, and um, yeah, I'm th trying to think of any other up upsides or downsides that come to mind, but not not really. I mean, that was the biggest upside, and the other the the other one, which is just kind of obvious when you when you um, uh, if if you're in a, if you're in a position like I was, that's just kind of you're, you're going to deal with um, you know money might be tight, but at the same time, like there's 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 other benefits too, so. Yeah, like to the financial aspect, right? For, for one, if you're constantly on the move, like a, a meat space occupation is probably going to be tricky. I mean, there are not that many physical occupa occupations where you can be that flexible with where you are in meat space. 
well, of course, when working in cyberspace on you know whichever project, uh, that allows you a lot more meat space flexibility. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I would guess that nomads who really do have this uh, digital income, hopefully in Bitcoin, right? Uh, that kind of <laughs> solves or at least, you know, helps with that first problem. Oh, yeah, it's it's huge. Um, it's 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 definitely huge. And it's why like uh, over at the Bonnie podcast, the first thing we talked about in season two, like when we got to, you know, the action was financial independence, because um, that's it's that 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 time really that time is that time is important. Um, it's really important. And then just um, there's also the fact when we're talking about Bonnie and, and vulnerability to coercion. Um, you know, the, the survival society nine to five employment, employment makes one very vulnerable to coercion. And a lot of time there's, you rely upon one source of income and that's not a good thing. It's not a wise thing to do as we kind of figured out, um, over the past year. For those of us who didn't already know that, you know, relying upon one single source of income was unwise. Now, now, now people know. Um, so yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. The, the, the internet, a lot of these opportunities, um, um, you know, these online opportunities, Bitcoin, um, it's huge. Um, definitely, definitely huge. Um, and, uh, yeah, so much so there was a project, there's, there's an out of funk project that, uh, that I was working on called Darklands, which was, it was supposed to be, um, it was supposed to be, um, yeah, basically that a job board, a privacy focused job board. Um, like you have your Indeed, um, well, one that would, you know, use pseudonyms and, you know, um, have Bitcoin privacy by default and those sorts of things. It's not, it's, it's, it's a defunct project now. We don't, don't have time for it, but, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, definitely an important thing. And it's, it's really the, it's really, um, it's really the first step. Um, it's really, really kind of, kind of that first step is either, either, um, you know, intensively save and, and uh, you know, put yourself in a position savings wise that you don't have to work, um, or, um, you know, yeah, finds a, you know, location independent employment. And, uh, it, it seems like that's kind of naturally just happening, um, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so that's, that's, um, good. Um, people kind of got that, that forced decompression time last year. Um, a lot of folks did, but, um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a, it's the first step. Um, it's definitely the first mm-hmm. step. Yeah, but it's either it can be a, a large pile of savings, right? But you know, even if you're unproductive and just accumulate or consume these savings, well, eventually they're gonna run dry. Right? So that's that's something to consider. So yeah, getting that true type mm-hmm. of digital income is for sure, or well, probably a must. Right? But the the other side to financial independence, not just on the income side, but on the expenditure side, right? If you if you spend less, well, your savings will last you longer. And so how did you feel the the cost aspect of this nomadic lifestyle compared to others? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the the biggest portion of most people, you know, if we're talking about the survival society, the biggest portion of people's income usually goes to like a mortgage or to to rent or something along those lines. So um, if you uh, if you move into, I guess, a situation um, like, uh, for example, Rayo, the first thing that the first lifestyle he pursued was van nomadism and Max like like you. Um, he, um, he moved out and he moved out into a van, um, into a camper mounted on his pickup truck. So obviously that major, that biggest expense is gone. Um, and, uh, we did, uh, uh an entire series on van nomadism, I guess a few years back on the Vani podcast. And, uh, yeah, um, from a bunch of case studies, a uh, bunch of different case studies, I mean, anywhere from like 500 to a thousand dollars a month, um, is what a lot of these people were living on. Um, and, uh, yeah, from, from my experience, um, I was staying, um, I was just, I was just camping out of my vehicle. Um, I was just, yeah, tent camping out of my Mercury Grand, Mercury Grand Marquee. Um, but, uh, yeah, I found, uh, I found a, a place to camp that was like $7 a night north of Austin. Beautiful place. And, uh, um, you know, um, <clears throat> like I said, the, the unfortunate part is I was dependent upon the survival society for everything. So I had to go buy, I had to buy everything. But I mean, I didn't have much to spend. I didn't have much to spend anyway. So I was kind of, I, I had to spend what I could spend and it was, it wasn't much. So. Um, yeah, um, cutting, cutting expenses is definitely, definitely important. Um, it's, uh, um, that alone, um, that step alone, um, could be, I guess, uh, that, that, that first step for a lot of people, if they just cut their, if they just cut their expenses up to a certain amount, they might find that instead of working 40 hours a week, they can now only work 20. And if that's, you know, half your time, um, and, uh, you know, you're halfway there to, uh, you know, a liber- liberated lifestyle per se. So, um, yeah, hopefully I answered your question. Ramble off there again. <laughs> no, no, I, I do enjoy the ramblings quite a lot. And yeah, I, I, like that's, that's a nice <laughs> thing, right? When, uh, just alone with cutting off a physical building and especially when combining your, your mode of transport and your place of living together, right? Into one entity, one truck basically to live out of, mm-hmm. uh, that, yeah, that save costs quite a bit. 
Uh, but like the the biggest downside, as you said, and I would very much agree with that, is that you do need to import a lot of things from from the first round, right? Food, diesel, mm-hmm. and all types of things. You're, you're constantly in need to trade with others. Uh, like, wh- where do you think are are the downsides of this more specifically? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, um, yeah. So the, the the I guess the mortgage, you know, the physical location's gone. That's a good first step. The next the next biggest expense from expense for most people is food. And if you move out into, um, you know, a van, um, or, and, or from like a mortgage into a, a, a apartment with small, with, you know, with less rent or something, you save more money. Um, then, I mean, uh, you're, you're limited, you're limited on space to do things, right? You're limited on, on, on the space you have to produce, um, whatever it is that you want to produce. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that, that's definitely, that's, that's definitely kind of the, the, the biggest downside is, uh, um, you know, dealing with that, um, yeah, dealing with that, I guess that that smaller space and, and something we're trying to um I mentioned Pasnia here and I mentioned uh, you know kind of the the groundwork for this was just traveling van nomads. Well, that is kind of that, that is one of the one of the I guess what one of the problems. Um so what's my vision my overall vision for Pasnia is more of kind of the second realm network. Um so we've got uh, this homestead um this homestead here uh, at, at Veritas Pasnia is what I'm um, what I'm calling it. And um, there's one out east. There's uh, you know freedomcells.org, which has a lot of it's just there's a lot of isolated people um, that need to be connected. Um, but really, the ideal I, the idea would be to have these self sufficient homesteads um, that you know of, of like minded people within the second realm network that have been vetted. And um, basically, you you get into this network and you can camp at any of these places. Um, you don't have to rely upon the first realm for food because, like for example, if you know mine's a model for for other homesteads, you'd have lamb, you'd have ducks, you'd have turkey, you'd have chicken. Um, like you'd have all of these things and you'd have, and this year we're starting a big garden too. So that's, that's the other thing. Um, but, <clears throat> but yeah, so like that, that's kind of the, the idea is, is one, like, so there's, there's kind of the, you know, the notion of having your cake and eating it too. Well, I'm trying to make that that's possible. Um, <laughs> like I'm trying to make it possible where you can, you can have like, um, where this network it gets built up and you could live a totally nomadic lifestyle. And still not be reliant upon the first realm where we have, you know, our own infrastructure, our own economy, um, all, all of those things. So, um, yes, to your point, that is the, the biggest thing with the, with nomadic lifestyles is just the fact that you can't take as much stuff with you. You have less, less room to produce, um, in most situations. Um, and the, the solution to that is, is, uh, as I was saying, kind of this, this second realm network, um, that I'm kind of, well, just kind of, I'm trying to, I guess, put together here in the USSA, but certainly, um, Certainly, um, I, I'm guessing it's probably already in motion um, elsewhere overseas. So, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. Uh, I, I, and like this aspect of secure citadels, right? Secure temporal autonomous zones and a mm-hmm. private and secure way of traveling in between them. Uh, I, I agree. I think this is really kind of the golden ticket <laughs> where you can have the cake and, and eat it too. Yep, and then um, and on that property, um, and here again, if you have your cake and eat it too, we'll add another layer to this. Um, you know, being like the one of the the biggest areas of coercion is you know, um, you know, the legal interstices with the state, where uh, like especially like with proper so called property ownership, where you've got a title, they they expect you to pay property property taxes every year, and those sorts of things. Like that opens up an individual to um, opens them up to to inevitable coercion. Like that's at least a couple times a year where you have to interface with the, with the state. On not a very fun and friendly level, right? So, um, you know, talking about the second realm here, um, the proxy merchant strategy, wherein the property that you, um, that you, you have these homesteads on isn't in the name of the person that actually lives there. It's in the name of somebody who is an upstanding person, upstanding citizen of the first realm, um, that would never draw suspicion from anyone. Um, and, uh, then you've got, a, you've got an, an added layer of protection there. And then, as I said, you, you, uh, you, just incorporate these security culture principles, these Vani principles that Rayo, um, you know, utilized back in the 1960s. And if any of your, um, any of, uh, any folks in the audience are inter- interested in checking that out, um, I would recommend just going to, uh, VaniPodcast.com, um, free books tab, and you can learn, learn about Rayo's lifestyle and, and get a pretty good taste, uh, um, there at, uh, um, from either Vani book one or Vani book two. But, uh, yeah, really just incorporating, incorporating these principles, um, and doing it in such a manner so that we can have this, this, uh, you know, permanent place, right? We can have this permanent place that can also be, um, relatively invulnerable to coercion. So that's, that's kind of the ideas. And you aren't supposed to be able to do that, right? Have your cake and eat it too. Well, we're going to try it and see, um, <laughs> see how it works out. 
Yeah, I mean, right. That's the, that's the whole point of of liberty of, of is to try to experiment, right, and to recklessly reach out into new areas that were deemed impossible before, and just to see if it actually works out mm-hmm. and, and maybe works out in a great extent. So you've you've mentioned now a couple yeah. of times, like the the concept of harassment, and this is, I think, one of the the great contributions of Rayo in the terms of of Wanu, like that definition of mean time to harassment. Now, what is that actually, and why is it a meaningful metric to look at? Mm hmm. So, um, so yeah, the mean time to harassment was, um, so really one of, one of the problems, I guess, that Rayo also foresaw is that there's a lot of, a lot of strategies where it's impossible, where it's nearly impossible to gauge the efficacy of a strategy. So, like, political crusading, for example, like, we know it doesn't work, but, like, if you actually try to, like, actually try to put it out statistically, like, it's very, very hard to actually quantify the success rate of someone running for office. Um, or for, for a lot of, for a lot of strategies, it's hard to quantify those things. So Rayo actually came up with this, this concept of mean time to harassment. And basically it's a way to gauge the, um, the efficacy of, of a, of a Bonnie lifestyle. So, um, for example, um, it would measure the amount of time between, um, instances of coercion. So for example, a van nomad who might have, uh, um, a van nomad might have more interactions, um, or have a, a lower mean time to harassment. Than um, someone who uh, practiced wilderness fauna in the middle of the woods, um, they would have more interactions with the survival society. They have more interactions with coercers in general. So that's the idea: is it's just a way to gauge the efficacy of a Vani, a Vani lifestyle, um, and it's in terms of how often um, you interact with um, with the state, with, uh, with with the state, or with private coercers. Is, is the idea? Yeah, right. And I like that aspect too, that it's, it's not just the state who's, who's of course a big attacker, but private individuals are assholes as well. Right? So, uh, like mm-hmm. just, you know, getting beaten over by thugs or your, your purse stolen, uh, is, uh, is, you know, harassment already. And, uh, just by including this statistic, as well as any interaction with the state, right? Like requiring a license plate or paying property taxes and all these, all these things where that are not based on a voluntary ethical uh, action can be nicely quantified and then as you said right compared across strategies and we can kind of get a su- success metric out of this right and and also mention one other element that he puts uh and, and vani book one again vani podcast.com just go to that free books tab if you want to pull up this chart um it's in vani book one the search for personal freedom but uh, there's a chart in there too and the other element that he puts on there is is, is activity so um, if you are a pedestrian, you know, traveling through the wilderness where there's nobody out there, the activity is going to be very, very low. Um, whereas if you are starting, you know, like small manufacturing facility, the activity is going to be a lot higher. So that's another element too is, um, another element to mean time to harassment is, is also gauging, you know, like your, your own efficacy and your own, um, your own, I guess, uh, possibilities, um, with, with your skills. Um, so someone who is not very proficient at, um, I don't know, security culture principles are not very proficient at, um, you know, practicing the grand man or something along those lines. They might not be the best person to like start an intentional community or something like that, right? Um, they might be best, uh, you know, getting a van and going and learning these things and trying it out and, you know, a, a more safer route, I guess you could say, one that would draw less attention, um, where they can, you know, kind of blend in and just kind of, um, learn these things in a, in a safe, a, a more, you know, safe and conducive environment. Um, so yeah, that's another, another element too when we're talking about Bonnie lifestyle changes is the activity or the proficiency, um, that one would need to have. Um, and again, to go back to this example, um, you know, starting intentional community, which involves, you know, dispute resolution and all sorts of complex stuff versus some driving a car around, which we're taught to do when we're 16, you know, by the state. So if the state can teach us to drive, um, you know, via their, you know, their dumb DMVs and shit, then it's probably a pretty easy thing to do, right? So. Um, yes, we're talking about proficiency levels here, uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the, the activity of, of what you do is, is very important here, right? And there's a scale, right? You, you could just be, you know, alone in the wilderness hunting and, and forestering berries or whatnot, right? But that's a very different thing than running a small manufacturer to produce, I don't know, the tables or some carpentry. And that's again very different to running a multinational global uh, corporation interacting with hundreds of, of customers mm-hmm. and employees. And there, there will be different attackers for each of these and different threat vectors and threat models that have to be considered. Yeah. 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 For sure. That's, the, that's, 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 yeah. Very, very well said. Very, yeah. Very well. I don't think I have anything to add, but that's a very good way to put it. Yeah. And I, I think here the, the concept of privacy really ties in nicely. 
Uh, so, like, where where do you see, or how, how would you define privacy, uh, and and how does it fit in here? Sure, sure. Um, so privacy, I guess, uh, to, to me is, uh, um, to me is just, uh, I guess it's, um, my right to self ownership, um, exposed when I want it to be, exp- or I guess, I guess, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's core to my self ownership, but really the, the idea is to, to expose myself when I want to expose myself, right? Um, and not mean that in the way that I'm not, don't mean that in the way that I think it is, but I expose myself to the world in the way, like when I, when I want to expose myself to the world in the way that I want to. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, having that choice. Um, is, 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 is really, is really privacy and. Yeah, maybe to, to paraphrase that, right? It's, it's about selectively revealing yourself to the world, right? And right. Yep. It's, it's much easier to, like, you get away with not at all revealing yourself to the world if you are in the, in the forest alone, you know, hunting a deer, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's a very limited type of exposure and very little individuals will actually see you and attribute the actions to your person, right? Well, Compared to if you were running this large business with thousands of clients and employees, well, you know, necessarily you will have to reveal yourself uh, to a greater extent so to get the job done. And, and right. then how, how does that aspect of when you actually reveal yourself come into the security aspect in terms of the OODA loop? Yeah, so um, in terms of volume more generally, you mean? Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, really it comes down to, uh, um, so there's, so yeah, with, with Vanu, obviously the lifestyle change would, would make a difference. If you're Vanuing in city, if you're Vanuing, uh, pursuing Vanu in a city, um, you're going to have a lot more exposure, potential exposure, um, than, yeah, as you're saying, someone who's, uh, you know, pursuing wilderness Vanu out in the middle of the woods. Um, so as far as when, um, you know, when that, that revealing happens, well, there, there's another important Vanu principle that Rayo came up with called, uh, import exports. Um, and, uh, the idea is to, uh, you know, import goods and knowledge from the servile society back to your Vanu home base. Uh, and then you export your labor back to, um, the servile society. So, um, this is, uh, you know, making up for the fact that, you know, back in the 1960s, they didn't have, you know, the online freelance entrepreneurship sort of angle. So back in the 1960s, you had to basically, ex- you had to go back to the city to work. Um, you'd, you'd work a really intensive, you know, maybe you'd work really intensive job for three months, intensively save. And then go live in the woods for six months was kind of his was kind of his strategy. So, um, how does the OODA loop and expo and I guess uh, you know selectively exposing oneself in, um, in, in terms of Vani? Well, um, it would come down to import export. Um, how often you choose to interface with the survival society. Um, so if you uh, if you have more if you have live more nomadic lifestyle and you have many supply caches on private property scattered throughout and you don't have to have very much interaction with the survival society, then um, you wouldn't have to, um, you know, reveal your privacy, um, reveal your privacy that often, um, you know, to, to the survival, survival society, to potential coercers. So yeah, it would come down to, um, yeah, just depending upon what lifestyle change you choose. Um, obviously more people, um, more chance of coercion, generally speaking. And, uh, then also import exports, uh, how often you need to interface with the survival society, um, would be how often you might have to, um, you might have to, or you might, uh, I guess, inadvertently uh, reveal your, your privacy in some manner. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, of, co- of course, most optimal would be if, if there would be no revelation to the first realm whatsoever, right? So if you could fully stay within that second realm mm-hmm. uh, in a Vanu principled uh, or ethical enclave. Uh, but this will be difficult, right? Because division of labor is nice, and there are many monkeys in the first realm who can do things for you. <laughs> and so somehow interacting with them uh, while still protecting your privacy and not necessarily revealing that you are the one engaging in that in that activity uh, is a very interesting privacy strategy. Uh, so, what are what are some of the steps to do this more efficiently? I mean, you you mentioned uh, uh, first realm proxy merchants already, but are there some some other strategies? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, in, in terms of volume, I guess, uh, another, another element of this that, that I could, um, that's, um, yeah, the, the, the proxy merchant strategy is, is, is really for, um, for more of the, uh, permanent autonomous zones. That's, that's kind of the route to go. Um, yeah, again, it, it's just dependent upon, on, upon the lifestyle change for, um, for, for folks. So a lot of folks are, are stuck in cities for, for one reason or another, maybe employment, maybe work, maybe, maybe whatever. Um, but, uh, in, in terms of, you know, privacy in the cities, um, I would just point, uh, um, point your, your listeners, uh, to, in the direction of, you know, strategies like the gray man blending in. Um, and then, 
Um, Kyle Reardon uh, posts on uh, my coast, old coast, I guess, on the Bonnie podcast now. Hopefully, if we'll be back, he'll be back at some point. Um, but he wrote a book called Just Below the Surface, A Guide to Security Culture. And uh, obviously, it goes into kind of the, the low tech and the high, some of the high tech sort of uh, sort of privacy stuff. Um, but then also, um, it goes into, um, I guess, a, maybe an, an often under um, an un- underlooked at aspect um, of this is that uh, um, like a, ac- he, he looked at uh, some activist organizations as case studies that have just been terrible on privacy. If you, if the, the leaders have been, you know, have been uh, have been, you know, infiltrated, you know, infiltrators and they reveal the entire you know membership list and, you know, intake information to, you know, the feds or something. So that's another element, too, is just um, be very, I guess, just be careful about who you who you interact with. Um, you know, practice, practice good vetting. Um, and, uh, you know, here at Pasnia, we've got a strict principle that, you know, you have to forswear the use of coercion, uh, if you're going to come on the property. So, um, you know, I just, uh, um, those would, those would just be, a, I guess, a, a couple of things, uh, in terms of some, some of the, some of the nomadic, um, some of the nomadic lifestyles. Um, it can, it can be difficult, um, especially for, um, uh, and again, I don't have personal experience with this, so everything that I find out is just just on the internet and from from folks who have reported on it. When I was on Facebook and they were you know posting groups and such, but um, like if you're living on a sailboat, for example, um, I have heard I've I've gotten we gotten verification from a number of on a number of occasions that like if you're going to go into a port like at a city, um, if you're going to go conduct import export on a boat, like not only do you have to check in with like one government agency, but usually it's like five different bureaucracies that you have to check in with. Um, like living on a sailboat. So as far as it, it can get, it's, it's very, very nuanced. And, um, and, and a lot, a lot of that nuance comes from, you know, experience of doing it over and over again. So, um, yeah, that's, that's just, uh, uh I, I'll mention living on a sailboat as, as, as that, that one kind of complication. Um, but, um, I guess other, other strategies, um, yeah, um, other strategies, I guess. Yeah, but like I said, just just be careful about who you, who you're working with. Make sure they're they're vetted. And um, yeah, I think that's 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 another important thing because it's it's not always this. It's um, it's not always the state. Like the state usually doesn't do a very good like the, the like um, you know as far as investigative work, they don't usually do any of that, right? Like um, it's usually just people snitching or open source intelligence. They just you know look on Facebook or something. So um, yeah, if you cut out, uh, you know, if you if you're just if you're careful about that. Um, yeah, I think that's a very, very good thing. And there's probably one point of conflict here that, uh, well, free individuals are usually private individuals, right? And they very carefully choose what to reveal uh, about themselves to others. But on the other hand, right, as you said, we kind of need to get that, that reputation and that vetting of the history of another person to ensure that they actually do live by voluntarist principles. So uh, how do you kind of manage that conflict of working with anonymous people while still gathering reputation from them. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely tough, but um, or at least it's it's tough, and it's in its it's in a, it's in a, it's in its early stages right now. Um, but yeah, I, I said for for Pasnia for this physical one, like um, you know, I do know the um, I like there's given them names and students for the for these individuals, but really it was just it was a spontaneous thing. I, again, I did not plan any of this. It just so happened that for the past five years, I've been vetting these people. Um, and they're all, you know, the, the best, the best people I want them out here. And that's why that they're coming out here. But, uh, um, yeah, so that, like, if you're, if you're in a position to plan something like that, like go to five years of freedom festivals, which, um, you know, and, and build up, you know, reputation that way, like that's a really good way. Or just, you know, other, other, you know, temporary autonomous zones with, you know, freedom minded individuals, um, you know, over a course of a number of years, um, you can pretty much tell, um, you can, you can, you can pretty much tell, um, I, I would say beyond that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, beyond that, uh, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it really, I think it's just, uh, experimenting with, rep- experimenting with reputation systems. Um, physical space and time, um, yeah, it's, that's tough because I, I, yeah, it's, that's, that's tough because I, I, the, at least, at least as at this point, I don't know these folks by, by, by pseudonyms. So, um, I know I'm at a deeper level than that. So, um, yeah, it's a w- little tough there. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's what, what I can offer. For, um, that's what I can offer at this point. Yeah, I've, like it's, I mean, for, for sure, right? The more you engage with both anonymous identities, the more they do reveal themselves and the more reputation you can gather up, right? Um, but mm-hmm. the, like it's, it's also a question of scale, right? Because sure, it's, it's small scale, 
you can probably do a very thorough vetting process and really consider uh, in depth if you want to work with one person or not. But of course, there's a huge cost to it, right? And and a lot of well uh, hassle and uncertainty that will probably fail to scale to any meaningful gathering of more than a couple hundred people. Yeah, yeah, and for for a lot of people, finding that first person to vet is hard enough. Um, you know, finding that first person that they're gonna, you know, the the vet for a local, you know, to start an intentional community or something, that's gonna be hard to find. Um, for 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 some folks even. Um, so yeah, the the you know having having that time. Um, yeah, having that time is great. Great. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it's a, yeah, experimenting with reputation systems. Um, you know, smuggler and uh, smuggler and X Y Z and second round book on strategy talked about uh, you know anonymous trading booths and things. Um, you know, like that's the sort of that like those are the I, I mean. Um, you know, here right now, like I said, like it's all very, very person personal. Like we're we're trying to build an intentional community here, so we all know each other very well. Um, but we also want to, you know, open that outwards. Um, and yeah, you know, start lo- start looking at some of these things too, because um, I mean, we we want to be able to trade with as many people as safely as possible, right? Like we want to open up open up trade, open up you know this pocket of freedom to as many people as we can. We have to do it in a safe manner, and if there's a way where we can trade, and not even have like uh, you know, I, I guess just additional ways um, like that. Um, yeah, I think those are, those are worth looking into, but yeah, all those are theoretical right now for me. Um, at least, the, at least a lot of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, really just the, the tried and true vetting, the tried and true method of vetting, whether it's, you know, um, whether it's, uh, you know, in person or online, um, you know, just <laughs> whether you know them or if, or someone that you both know and trust can, um, can verify. Like that's still, that's still, I, I think, kind of the the best way to go. Um, I, I don't see a, see a way around that. I don't know if I want to go around that that more personable route, um, personally. Yes, and I wonder how much technology can actually help us to kind of scale that interaction, specifically because we can use you know advanced cryptography and you know incentive structures so that we can collaborate with others without necessarily re- relying trust or security. Uh, into their hands. Right? So, for example, the Wasabi CoinJoin coordinator is a perfect example for this, as it is a centralized service, right? but that central service has no information about its customers whatsoever. And therefore, attacks and harassment by that service provider, or even someone attacking the service provider, uh, become no longer feasible, right? because there is literally nothing to steal. And because of that, like specifically the Wasabi coordinator can, in fact, or talk and do business with a plethora of anonymous people without any reputation whatsoever, just because that the underlying uh, protocol is secure enough. Sure, sure, yeah, um, yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure technology can play a role. I mean, uh, um, I, the last time we talked, Max, we, we uh, you know, referred back to Rayo's, um, I guess, theoretical vision of what I guess turned out to be um, BISC in some ways, but. Uh, um, yeah, just, uh, um, uh, yeah, really tr- trying, trying to find ways, uh, tr- trying to find ways using, using technology to, to do these things. Um, yeah, I, th- I think there's, uh, there's, there's, yeah, um, especially in the realm of, uh, Bitcoin and, uh, as encrypted communications, there's, there's certainly a lot of, I think a lot of promise there. Um, definitely, definitely for sure. Um, but yeah, for reputation, um, yeah, still, still, uh, still like the, uh, um, still like the personable routes, um, which, yeah, again, doesn't always, work doesn't always work and scale for, for digital which i understand um but uh yeah yes now one other interesting way to get at least a level of reputation is with financial skin in the game and i i know that you're experimenting with with some type of like uh financial shared bitcoin accounts uh, that, that can be used in like emer- for emergency expenses could you elaborate a bit more on, on how that actually works for you Yes. Um, yes. So, um, obviously, uh, yeah, that's another, um, another great method of, uh, you know, uh, a great vetting method, which is not, not an ironclad one, but you can weed out, um, you can weed out a number of folks, a uh, number of folks that way you can find the most committed ones at least. Um, but yeah, um, at, uh, uh for Pasnia, um, we've got a stakeholder, um, thing, which, uh, people can, I guess, uh, it's kind of like the, the membership thing for the intentional community. Um, uh, but beyond that, we have the, um, just, uh, a fellow Pasnian. Um, who, uh, uh, Philip Pazni came up with this idea. We call it the, uh, establishment of the Pazni General Bitcoin Fund. Um, and you'll note if for, for people, if you, if you look at Pazni.com, most of this is culture jamming. So, like, it's supposed to be, a, it's supposed to be a joke, supposed to be funny. Um, so yeah, this is the, the Pazni General Bitcoin Fund. And, uh, 
um, yeah, the, the person that set it up. And I guess this is a good, uh, I guess one, one interesting way for, um, for, for reputation is that, you know, he goes by a pseudonym, Josiah Warren. Um, yeah, Josiah Warren was a potential community guy back uh, a while ago, I think in the late 1800s for those who, who are interested. But, uh, um, yeah, to, um, to, to some of the folks, um, that have, you know, seen this fund and all that. Um, he's just a synonymous individual, but, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's verified and all that. But yeah, that, the idea is, uh, um, he set up this fund. Um, you know, they've, they've got to be a pas, they've got to be a stakeholder. Pasnia, um, you know, he, he laid out some, some stipulations. But yeah, the, the idea is, um, if there's, um, you know, for a, for a, you know, legal defense fund for homestead upgrades for, um, he even put in if someone wants, you know, publishing assistant or needs, uh, you know, help with publishing. Um, you know, that's in there too. Um, but yeah, the, the idea is he, 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 uh, made an initial donation into this, into this Bitcoin fund. Some other folks made, uh, made donations. And so I think, um, as of the last that I heard as, um, as of a couple of weeks ago, um, a portion of that fund's going to be, uh, allocated towards, uh, you know, the, a Pasnia out, uh, that Pasnia out east. Um, so there's going to be some, some hopes, homestead upgrades happening, um, you know, to the overarching Pasnia network. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a little bit on the, on the Pasnia general Bitcoin fund. But yeah, just, uh, um, yeah, just a, a way to, to, to crowdfund, uh, to, to, to crowdfund some, some second realm activity. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Uh, and I remember from the book hashtag Agora, which I believe you also have published, uh, uh, there, there is the scene mm -hmm. where, where the two characters, uh, are, you know, uh, traveling with some contraband, some, some laptops, uh, high security devices that they plan to sell. And ultimately they get, uh, snitched up by, by the cops, uh, and, uh, let into some mm -hmm. interrogation uh, camp. While then the, uh, because they were in such a second realm, or gathering and specifically part of such a security fund, right? Uh, their comrades, uh, basically outside, not yet under attack, then issued, uh, like, uh, or got a lawyer to actually get them out of the situation, right? And in, in this way, even though you're under attack, because you know that there is some amount of Bitcoin stashed outside for specifically those purposes, uh, to get you out of the, the uh, tough situation, Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a, a very big de uh, decrease of uncertainty, uh, and uh, at, at least the, the hindrance of the level of harassment that it can be happening. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And um, I was uh, I talked to uh, to Sal Mayweather from the Agora podcast a couple 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 few weeks ago, and one thing that's uh, um, I think it was Derek, another Derek Rose, another guest brought up was kind of like an Agora's defense fund, like some sort of like worldwide cooperative sort of thing. Um, I think I, I think all those things are are, are fantastic. Um, and, uh, they, they need to be, they need to be pursued. I mean, it's another, regardless of, um, um, you know, when it comes to the second realm, regardless of what area of the human experience we're talking about, like all of that needs to be internalized, you know, like in the second realm. Um, because if it exists in the first realm, it, it exists in the realm of coercion, um, at the very least and often at the violation of privacy too. So, um, yeah, this is just another one of those things, uh, you know, what, what if you want to call it, uh, charity or, um, wh whatever it is, I mean, this, that, this is an element, um, you know, this is, uh, this is an element of it. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy it's, uh, I, 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 so yeah, shout out to Josiah Warren for, uh, for coming up with this and, uh, for funding the fund if it, uh, initially. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Very useful endeavor. Absolutely. Um, as, as you mentioned previously, uh, Ray will also spoke a lot about, well, encrypted communications. Uh, so maybe can you elaborate a bit on, on why this is so important in the Vonu strategy? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I say a lot uh, that you know, if the coercers can't find you, they can't coerce you. Well, if the coercers can't read what you write, then they can't use you know, they can't use your words against you. Um, if all if all it is is just you know uh, illegible uh, you know ciphertext, um, then uh, yeah, they can't really they can't really get a whole lot of that a whole lot out of that. Um, so yeah, that, that's uh, yeah, encryption, um, encrypted communication certainly plays a role in in, in, uh, in the Vanu sphere, and. Um, I mean, uh, um, a further iteration, I would say, you know, we've got, uh, you know, Ray, Ray talked about kind of the encrypted ham radio networks. Um, there's, uh, you know, obviously the low tech, you know, low tech, um, you know, ciphers, um, you know, using, you know, pen and paper. Um, well, uh, I guess a, a newer kind of iteration that I'll toss in that's, uh, that's how Ray actually wrote an article on it's, uh, in, in his book, uh, just below the surface, he got a security culture, but that's called dual layer encryption. And so uh, the idea is that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, digital, digital encryption is great, but why not add an extra layer of security to it? So, um, the idea is to come up with a, um, you know, come up with like a, uh, um, you know, handwritten cipher. Um, and you would put that into PGP. You would, you write the message, you'd encrypt it with the handwritten cipher, whatever, whatever you guys agree, whatever you and the, the, the recipient agree upon. 
um, you would put that into, say, PGP or whatever encryption software you're using. It would encrypt it there. Then they would decrypt it on their ends digitally. Then they would decrypt it manually on the other end. So, yeah, I mean, all this stuff um, plays into it. If you look uh, if uh, you, you look into Rayo's writings, he was, you know, I mean, back in the 1960s, like there like there are some things like. I mean, he, he, he went about as far as, yeah, he went about as far as you could, um, in the realm of, yeah, in this realm of, you know, privacy and security culture. So, um, yeah, it, it plays a major role, um, plays a, a major role. Um, again, if the course can't find you, they can't coerce you. And if they can't read what you write, then they can't use your words against you. So, um, yeah. Yes, that's, uh, that really is an, an important part, right? And especially when it comes to trade. I don't mean, sure, some chit chat and small talk. Uh, it wouldn't even be that bad if the coercers would find that. But if we're actually talking about business dealings and contracts, then yes, encrypting communications is, is even more important and as there's actual physical property on the line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So one of the other things that you also mentioned a bit previously was basically stashing, right? And having uh, physical locations where some equipment or food is stored. Can you please go a bit more into the details of why this is important and how to actually set it up? Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. So the, the idea is, uh, you know, as, as we, we talked about a little bit ago with nomadic lifestyles, the, the idea the, the one of the problems is storage or, um, you know, self-sufficiency, right? Like if you always have to go to the survival society for food, then, um, you know, you're not very you know independent from it. So, um, you know, you know, Rayo, um, back, uh, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, he had supply caches, uh, you know, all over, I think, in British Columbia region, uh, Northern California, Southern Oregon, uh, the Siskiyou region. Um, you know, with, uh, with food, you know, camping supplies, whatever, whatever he may, he may, may have needed out there, uh, you know, in the wilderness. So, um, yeah, the, the idea is, uh, you know, and, and, and that sort of sense, more of an individual sort of sense, um, to, you know, bury supply caches with things you might need, um, in that area, if, 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 if ever need be. And, um, you, so you, you'd have access to them. It gives you, it, it increases your storage space. Um, at least it, it's, it's another way of, of having your cake and eating it too. And uh, I guess the, the, the newest iteration of that and what we're, as, as I've been talking about, what we're trying to do yeah, with Pasnia is, is make it where, you know, these supply caches aren't just, you know, supp- aren't just, you know, empty 55 gallon drums, but, um, they're actually like, uh, it's actually like a, a community with a culture and with, you know, all sorts of stuff. So, um, yeah, that's that's just the idea. It's a it's a, it's a way to um, increase the the storage and self and uh, self sufficiency capabilities, um, despite uh, you know living a nomadic lifestyle and not having uh, you know a, a twenty two acre homestead, or not having a, a house with a basement and, and a storage room uh, or things like that. It's uh, these are these are ways of, of adapting to um, yeah adapt. These are yeah ways of adapting to um, yeah, smaller living spaces and, and just different situations in general. Yes, and in addition to that, I found it always very interesting when Sreyo said that it's also a kind of nice diversion tactic, so that, for example, if you have a campsite somewhere where there are not many goods laying around, there's not much food, uh, there's not many tools, there's not much wood supply or whatnot, right? If it's if it's just a bare bone, you know, living quarter, then this looks much less suspicious, right? Uh, compared to if you know there's a year's worth of food supply and such on stashed in the campsite directly that will draw a lot of attention if someone actually passes by so that idea that even though if you would have a physical location to store some of your wealth uh, it it, uh, like hidden and dispersed away from your actual main living place makes your main living place also less attractive for looters uh, which is a great uh, privacy and security strategy again yeah, yeah, uh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and, re- and redundancy, uh, especially, you know, we're, we're talking, uh, you know, digital, uh, d- digital realm now or, you know, Bitcoin private keys, uh, um, don't only keep that at, you know, one Vanu home base, you know, make sure those are, uh, you know, all spread all over the place and that you always, uh, always have a way to access them. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, they're, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're great tools. Um, certainly great tools. And, uh, I guess I will mention just, uh, since we're, we're on this realm, I, I came across a book by, uh, Lumpanks Unlimited. Um, called uh, how to, I guess uh, it's the big book, big book of secret hiding places, and um, the uh, the author Jack Luger goes into uh, into, into some of that stuff. It's available for free online, um, as all our stuff is, um, as as everything I put out is. But um, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about the hiding stuff, um, I uh, I found that to be a very uh, very valuable book um, to, to to read and to digitize. So 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll toss that one out there. And then also we talked about, uh, um, the Vani podcast. If, if people just go to vanipodcast.com forward slash episodes, um, it's all laid out by seasons. Season one is the philosophy of Vani. Season two is the practice of Vani. Um, and season two, we talk about food storage, uh, in one episode. And, um, I think there's probably another episode or two that talks about, uh, you know, similar and related subjects. I'm not thinking about the top of my head. Um, yeah, yeah, great tools for sure. Yes, so I, th- I think we did cover quite a decent amount of ground uh, in, in the Vanu philosophy. Uh, is there any major point uh, that we have not yet talked about? Um, not really. I guess um, I guess I, I should have, um, which, which hopefully um, folks have gone and checked it out by now if they if they're interested. But um, Vanu is a is an awkward contraction of the words voluntary and not vulnerable. Um, and uh, yeah, just premise around becoming as invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the survival society as humanly possible. That's what uh, all of the all of the Vani lifestyle changes are geared are geared towards. Um, that's why I found this the second realm strategy so um, you know so so important. That's why I find uh, you know uh, Bitcoin privacy um, just so critically important. Um, you know, like it's uh, these these are all very very in- interconnected strategies. Um, and uh, I, I yeah I, I certainly do hope that uh, your audience find, finds value in it, checks it out, and, and lets me know if, if they're living a liberated lifestyle. Always always love to hear about it. So um, yeah. Yes, uh, very nice, right? That, that, that aspect, like, I, I appreciate Vanu not just because I think it's actually a sound strategy for a freer lifestyle, but also because it has that ethical emphasis at the foreground, right? It, it has to be a voluntary interaction. Otherwise, it's not even in the realm of Vanu whatsoever. And so it, it completely, uh, uh, makes it impossible for one who actually lives by the strategy to become aggressive and, and to become that coercer. Um, and, and as you, as you said, right, anyone who comes to Pasnia and actually steps on your property will have to swear that he does not aggress against others. Yeah. Well, and in, in a sense, yes, everyone here, like what we, we do have, uh, if <laughs> again, it's the free Republic of Pasnia, if uh, we do have a declaration of independence and the constitution, um, so yeah, the, the initial stakeholders, um, I, I think all of them have probably, um, you know, actually signed so what maybe with the student, which is what we encourage here. We don't, we, we, we always encourage, uh, students here. But uh, yeah, they, a lot of them have explicitly signed the Constitution. But yes, um, that it's 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 critical. Um, it's it's a critical foundational um, point. You know, there there are a lot of people in my in my personal life who I know they're good people. Um, but uh, you know, I I I I don't really want to trade with them. I don't really want to um, interact with them a whole lot because they they still um, you know they haven't exercised that that uh, that spook of coercion. They haven't exercised that. So. Um, you know, I, I hope they do. And, you know, I want, we obviously want to open up Pasni as, to as many people as possible. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, this is just this way we have to do it. But, um, same, same time, um, you know, it's, uh, it's still a lot, it's a, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, you know, guys, uh, I, I, I've tried to emphasize this in the past couple interviews I've done, but, uh, you know, free, freedom is definitely possible. And especially, you know, um, um, you know, people who have been listening to Max know, know that. So, um, yeah, it's definitely possible. And, uh, with that, yeah, Max, thanks for inviting me on. It was a great chat, and uh, yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, Vanu is yours for the making, uh, to to steal your catchphrase, <laughs> but it's uh, it's, it's <laughs> yep. a very adequate one. Right? Uh, it, it really is possible uh, to live a free life and, and a peaceful life, and, and not just to to just survive meagerly uh, in, in such a place, but actually excel. Uh, I, I think both you and I can speak for that, of, of how refreshing it is to to have these priorities as the foundational building block for how, how to structure your own life. Uh, it's, it's, it's very rewarding and uh, something that I for sure can very much recommend to, to further pursue and, and to go down, uh, even though that it, it might look uh, scary and unintuitive at first. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yep, that's, uh, yes, it, exactly. And now, again, to, to quote one more time, uh, the book, The Agora, um, or hashtag Agora, um, <laughs> uh, one important phrase uh, that probably all agorists should be interested in, and just to, to now finish this up. Uh, Shane, what are you actually selling? Um, what, what am I actually selling? So, um, so, uh, I do, uh, uh, so I have a liberty published, uh, liberty, liberty focused publishing outfit called the Marantac Publications, um, libertyantac.com. We have, uh, um, right now we've got, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of books, strategy guides, a lot of books on Vani that I've digitized uh, and put out in paperback format for for those who uh, you know don't like to read things off off computer screens, or off digital screens in general. Um, but uh, we also we've also sold some some crypto anarchy tools. Uh, we sold a, a Vani pad, a Vani ghost pad with all sorts of cool hacking accessories. Um, we've only sold one of those so far, and uh, hoping to get a lot more of those uh, those sorts of tools back on there. So it's not just books. Um, we are going to try to offer some really really. Uh, um, 
Um, yeah, some really, really valuable um, crypto anarchy tools there. Uh, and then your future. Um, and uh, if any of your audience is, uh, uh, you know, writing a book and they're, uh, they need help with uh, the publishing process, so we help with that too. Uh, LibertarianTech.com is to go for all that. And uh, as I've been talking about, Vanu podcast, um, yeah, I sell freedom strategies essentially is what I do. Um, that's my job now, I guess I can say. Um, so yes, uh, Vanu podcast uh, uh, for, 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 the, for, uh, for that. You can find us on all the major podcatchers. Um, library and Odyssey as well. Um, got everything backed up there. And uh, otherwise, um, yeah, Paznia.com. Um, if you're interested, if you're you know in uh, the USSA, and uh, you know you uh, you'd like to to come uh, to come visit the Free Republic, uh, Paznia.com is the place to go to learn more. Uh, we've got uh, uh, various Telegram chats. Um, you can find links to those uh, on the website and um, more information about Vanu Fest. Vanu Fest two is happening at the end of the year. Um, and yeah. Otherwise, I mean, uh, I guess I guess that's uh, I guess that's it. Uh, when are the silver coins and gold coins are actually going to be issued? Uh, that's a that's a good question. So I may I guess it was a lack of foresight on my part. Um, a bad time to try to get custom coins printed. A really really bad time to do so. Um, yeah, that that was going to happen last year. Um, but yeah, it's probably not going to happen for for at least uh, at least a couple of years. Um, the 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 few companies I found that were still doing their custom minting, they had a way too high of limit. We don't have ta- we don't have a treasury here at Paznia. We don't have we don't have uh, you know we don't have taxation or anything. We can't afford that sort of thing yet. So um, we'll have to we'll have to wait uh, until we have the the funds for that. But uh, yeah, at soon. some point, hopefully soon, 3D printers who can do gold and silver <laughs> that will be great. Yes, and and the uh, the other problem too is the you have to get um, regardless of how many you print, whether you print five or twenty five or five thousand, you have to print. Uh, I guess it's the um, I, I don't know what you would even call it. I, I guess the the uh, the uh, oh gosh the stencil for it, the stencil for it. Um, you have to yeah, it's 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 hundreds of dollars just for the stencil. Um, and if we're gonna do six varieties, you gotta have six different stencils. And I think that I think it, it, it it's there's a lot to it. I looked in the entire process. The 3D printer would have been, was an interesting one as well, um, because we did ha- we did have one of those on the property from Bonnie Fest one, um, for for a little while. Um, but yeah, it's just too complicated at this time. Um, gold, yeah, gold, silver, yeah, little little out of our, our reach. <laughs> Well, uh, then maybe you can uh, do some some digital coins. Uh, maybe get some color coins on Bitcoin, <laughs> or uh, just a bunch of open dimes uh, <laughs> with a Pasnia theme. Uh, that will be interesting too. Well, yeah, Shane, right. thanks so much for coming on the show. We really was a pleasure to talk with you about uh, all things Vanu, agorism, and just living a freer lifestyle in the here and now. Uh, very fascinating rabbit holes. And again, for all the listeners, uh, check out all the great work that uh, Shane has released. Really, a, a plethora of knowledge and in a, a great archive. Uh, so, thanks a lot for coming on. Hey, thank you, Max. I appreciate it. <laughs>